appreciate that. I, I appreciate being here so much. I don't know how I haven't been here before. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is home. <laughs> um, and I'm just now coming back. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Joseph Campbell changed my life. I, I didn't know a man at all, but I knew of Joseph Campbell. And they're very similar figures. They're great synthesizers and teachers. Uh, Manly Hall was that, uh, had no credentials. They're similar too in that Joe, you know, refused to get his PhD because it was too limiting. And Manly just didn't even try. I'm, I'm not even sure he had a high school diploma, but he produced 20 books, and thousands of lectures and pamphlets. I always say he was an autodidact and a polymath, just to use some big words. Uh, he uh, taught himself everything and remembered everything. And if that weren't enough, he had this amazing gift of teaching. So uh, it's pretty intimidating to stand in his auditorium every Tuesday night. Uh, but I do, and we have some amazing speakers uh, every Tuesday night. Uh, we've had Will Lynn speak. I'm hoping to get Devin to speak on Dionysus if he ever lets her go. Yeah, <laughs> he should be soon. <laughs> I just want to check, can everyone hear okay? I do have a wireless mic that I forgot that to put on great. you. Okay. Well, do you mind taking a minute? Not at all. Okay. I'll try to project. All right. Let's get to it because I have three hours of material, and Devin said I can do it all. No. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I was taking a head wow. You got away with it. <laughs> you can. Relax. <laughs> I'm not doing three hours, two and a half. Uh, all right. So this is a story from the Pueblos. These are the Pueblos. Uh, most of them anyway. Uh, 19 of the 21 are in New Mexico. And you can see they're right along the river there, which, as you will see, is a very important feature. And the translation of Pueblo? That's my next slide. Yes. <laughs> How about that? Actually, I'm trying to do two things here. You want to sound better? Okay. So Pueblo just means town, right? Except for the Pueblo tribes, it comes to mean the people of the town, all right? Um, and eventually the people. This is a common designation among Native American peoples. It's, for example, the Diné, where's my Diné expert, uh, means the people, basically. Um, you find this pretty much throughout Native American tribes. Um, you might know the Pueblo ancestors as Anasazi, uh, which is now out of favor, uh, <laughs> and in favor of ancestral Pueblo, because the Puebloans said, you know, that's a Navajo word that means enemy ancestor. So oh. maybe don't call us that, right? <laughs> so the preferred term now is ancestral Pueblo. We're going to see a lot tonight about the relationship, or some tonight, about the relationship between the Pueblos and the Navajos. Uh, and so they had these complex and multi-storied adobe villages. That's Mesa Verde in Colorado there. Um, they are one of the few tribes um, who got to remain on their land. Thank you. Thank you so much. See, uh, it's just one thing too many I have to think about. Yeah, so uh, that's Mesa Verde in Colorado. I think you know probably Pueblos, especially if you've been to Taos Pueblo, probably the most famous, thanks to Georgia O'Keefe and D.H. Lawrence and others. They did get to remain on their land pretty much. There's a Pueblo in Texas, and of course, the Hopi uh, in Arizona are Pueblo people. They also believe in these casino spirits, these mountain spirits, who come down at certain times and instruct the people. Uh, and in fact, instruct the people sometimes means terrify the children, <laughs> if we're going to be honest about it. Uh, be good, or this mountain spirit will you know, come and visit you. Uh, we did the same thing, just in different ways. All right. Uh, so they, they're really remarkable peoples. Uh, they're the only successful Native American revolt um, on the continent. So in 1610, I think it was, a Puebloan named Pope uh, got together with some of his friends and overthrew the Spanish, kicked them out of that area there. Of course, they came back a few decades later, but it was 
a small victory, if a Pyrrhic one, ultimately. All right, and mainly they are peoples of an oral culture. I suspect you may know something about this being here tonight, but let's go over it just in case. Uh, one of my, my first doctoral seminar was on orality and literacy, and I still carry it around with me because it's so stunning what the medium of our communication does to us psychically. And, and when it changes, it changes us psychically. And the seminal book in this area is Walter J. Ong, Orality and Literacy, 1982. And here's a few of the things he says. First of all, and this is going to require an act of the imagination on our part, so take a breath and let's try to go to an oral culture. Right? What does that mean? Well, that means everything is based in sound, not vision, right? at least in terms of communication. It's based in sound. It's oral. Right? So you've got you've to take away your iPhone, you've got to take away your iPad, or your crappy little surface pad there, Will. You can't <laughs> have that. Sorry. Uh, you can't have pen and paper. Right? You can't have writing. And you can't have what Ong would call secondary orality. You can't have video. You just have sound. Well, what about sound? Sorry. There's no way to stop sound and have it at the same time. I can, this is Walter Ong speaking. I can stop a moving picture camera and hold one frame fixed on the screen, but if I stop the movement of sound, I have nothing. I have silence. No sound at all. All sensation takes place in time, but no other sensory field totally resists a holding action, stabilization in quite this way. Vision can register motion, but it can also register immobility. Indeed, it favors immobility. For to examine something closely by vision, we prefer to have it stand still. We often reduce motion to a series of still shots, the better to see what motion is. There is no equivalent of a still shot for sound. Right? What does that mean? If sound is the only communication, it means that if you don't remember it, it's gone. Not forgotten, gone. And there is information in oral cultures. There is knowledge in oral cultures. But it is the only container for it is sound. And of course, that ultimately means story. Right? So how do you hold on to this information, this vital information? And, and again, I think you all probably know this, but we're not talking about entertainment. The stories can be entertaining, but we're talking about the lifeblood of the culture. We're talking about where the water is when you go north past the mesa. There's a story about that. If you don't know that story, you don't get the water. It's life and death. There's a mountain lion, you know, in the valley below the mesa. You don't want to go there. Stories convey information. They, they are the only conveyance of information in an oral culture. So what do you do? Well, you build up these formulas. It's all right, come on in. All right. You build up these formulas so that, you don't, so that you don't remember a whole series of individual pieces. You clump them together. And so, what color is the sea in the Odyssey? Wine dark. Wine dark sea. <coughs> Wine dark seems very vivid, right? So you're actually creating images. You're just doing the sound. Wine dark sea. What color is the dawn in the Odyssey? Rosy fingered. The rosy fingered dawn. Isn't that great? Did you say that, Devin? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I don't need credit. There are others. Red in the morning. My father used to say this. He was in the navy. Red in the morning, sailor take warning. Red in the night, sailor's delight. You put together these formulas. 
And if you read the Odyssey or the Bible or any other oral text, you'll see them everywhere. They're actually annoying most of the time throughout for people in the literate culture. They look uncreative, but they're not. They are, in fact, originally creative. All right. I don't want to spend too much time here because I think you probably get the sense. Orality is additive. So there are no subordinate clauses in oral stories, in oral cultures. There are no subordinate clauses. It's just and this, and this, and this, and this. Why would you, how could you even construct, you know, these parenthetical subordinate elements? That's, that's a literate thing. So it's just and this, and this, and this, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Redundancy, you keep repeating the same thing. This is pretty basic um, effective speech. Right? Tell them what you're going to say, say it, then tell them what you said. Used to be for presidential oratory. I don't know what it is now, um, but let's not get into that. Concreteness. I love this. Um, for example, among the Plains tribes, the what we would call January is called Moon of the Popping Trees. We call it January. Ask somebody why we call it January. Janice. Well, yeah, but they don't know that. Do you know that? <laughs> and it's, it's the Roman god Janice, but all right, what's that? Even that got to do with us. But if, you're in, if it's January and you're in Nebraska, trees are popping. That's experiential, right? It's not abstract. Janice is abstract. Wait, Roman god of, do you have two faces or something? That's abstract. You've immediately abstracted um, the experience. But if you're in among the popping trees, that's experiential. And this is what I love. They have experiential logic. A.R. Luria, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, did some studies, uh, anthropologists did some studies of oral culture. And he wanted to look at how oral cultures thought, because they do think, of course, they're not unthinking, they're just unliterate. Um, and so, he wanted to try out various logical exercises. So, very simply, he asked one of them, uh, one of the people in the, it's, who was in Siberia in this culture, what's a tree? Now, we know what to do. You're asking for an abstract definition of a tree. And the participant in the study said, you don't know what a tree is? Where are you from? Experiential. That's a tree. What do you mean, what is a tree? That. Experiential. Grounded, always. And this is my favorite. Um, in philosophy, there's a little, little three-part argument called uh, the syllogism. You actually use them all the time. I don't know. You use an enthymeme, which is a syllogism with one of the premises suppressed. So feel free to take that away tonight and use it <laughs> however you like. An enthymeme is a syllogism with one of the uh, premises suppressed. But you know this. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore, Socrates is mortal. Right. Anthropologist says to, uh, Luria says to one of these people, in the far north, all the bears are white. Nova Zimbla, the Arctic, is in the far north. What color are the bears there? I. No, I don't know. I've never been there. <laughs> That's the answer. How would I know what color the bears are if I haven't been there? How would I know that there are bears? And, for, and in that little parable, you get to see the history of contact on this continent. The conflict between the oral and the literate, between the experiential and the abstract. One final thing on oral cultures. Communication is human. That's not a romantic notion, though it can be. It's human. It's this. In an oral culture, if I want to tell you a story, if I want to tell you I love you, 
I want to tell you I hate you, you've got to be present. Maybe I can create some weird thing, like a sign on a rock. Why would I do that? I'll just come tell you. It is human. It is communal. And that is not romanticization. That is simple basics of communication. It's physics. We're doing it right now. Right? All right. Now let's tell some stories. It was the Navajo feast day, and the Navajo feast day is a really important day for the Pueblos because it began when some Navajos came over and stole some food a long time ago. The Pueblo, men of the Pueblo village, said, what are you doing? Why are you stealing our food? We were starving and we were going to die. Well, come eat some food. That's the beginning of the Navajo feast day where no Pueblo person can refuse a Navajo any food or hospitality when he or she visits. Right? It's this magnificent feast of abundance and excess. How wonderful is that, right? You take what we would consider a crime and criminals, and you redeem it all in the name of beauty and excess and food. So on the Navajo feast day, there, was, there were these starving coyotes. They were looking out over the mesa. And they see all these dancers. And they see all that food, and the food starts to waft up to the mesa. The coyote's like, oh man, I'm so hungry. They're having such a good time. You know coyote, right? You know what's coming, trouble, right? He's like, well, I, don't, I just don't know how to get down this mesa, off this mesa. Remember, this is not the logical, this is mythological, right? So it doesn't matter that he, he does know, that's not the point. So he says, you know what? I just gotta get some of that food, but it's so far down. Um, I'll tell you what, let me get my cousins. So he calls out, oh, oh, cousins. Come, let's have a feast. Let's dance. Look, look down there at all that food. When they said, well, how are we going to get down there? He's like, this is why I've called you. We're going to make a coyote chain. What? <laughs> What's a coyote chain? Let me tell you. One of you will go over. The next one will grab the tail, and the next one will grab the tail, and we'll get down off this mesa. And they're like, oh, I don't know, cousin. That sounds pretty strange. No, no, trust me, he says, because Coyote is always saying, trust me. <laughs> and sure enough, they start down, and it's working, and their, their mouths are watering, and they can smell the food, and, and then one of them farts. That's the appropriate <laughs> And the one behind him says, Oh, what stinks? And when he opens his mouth, all the coyotes fall. Oh. They were kind of asking for it. <laughs> and then? <laughs> there is an ant there, actually. This is Leslie Marvin Silco, contemporary writer that we're going to be talking about tonight. And let's hear her poem called Dosh, a Luna, a Luna Coyote story, written for Simon Ortiz in 1973. And coyotes out there now. In the wintertime, when you see this, this is John Quick to see Smith, my favorite Native American artist. It's called uh, Coyote Speaks. Isn't that great? In the wintertime at night, we tell coyote stories. We drink spinata by the stove. How Coyote got his ratty old fur coat. Bits of fur with the sparrows had stuck on him with dabs of pitch. That was after he lost his proud original one in a poker game. Anyhow, things like that are always happening to him. That's what he said, anyway. And it happened to him at Laguna and Chinle, 
and Luca Chukai too, because Coyote got too smart for his own good. But the Navajos say that he won a contest, contest once. It was to see who could sleep out in a snowstorm the longest and Coyote waited until Chipmunk, Badger, and Skunk were all curled up under the snow, and then he uncovered himself and slept all night inside. And before morning, he got up and went out again and waited until the others got up before he came in to take the prize. Some white men came to Acoma and Laguna a hundred years ago, and they fought over Acoma land and Laguna women. And even now, some of their descendants are howling in the hills southeast of Laguna. By the way, that's Silco. Her grandfather was white. Coyote wanted to run for governor. And he said that when he got elected, he would run the other men off the reservation and keep all the women for himself. One year, the politicians got fancy at Laguna. They went door to door with hams and turkeys and they gave them to anyone who promised to vote for them. On election day, all the people stayed home and ate turkey and laughed. <laughs> the Trans-Western Pipeline Vice President came to discuss right away. The Lagunas let him wait all day long because he's a busy and important man. Mm -hmm. And late in the afternoon, they told him, come back again tomorrow. They were after the picnic food that the special dancers left down below the cliff. And Oosh and his cousins hung themselves down over the cliff, holding each other's tail in their mouth, making a coyote chain until someone in the middle farted and the guy behind him opened his mouth to say what stinks and they all went tumbling down one of them. Howling and roaring, Oosh scattered white people out of bars all over Wisconsin. He bumped into them at the door until they said, excuse me, and the way Simon meant it, it was maybe for 300 or 400 years. This is Silco. She's a poet, novelist, and essayist. She's author of Storyteller, Ceremony, Almanac of the Dead. She had a scholarship to study law at the University of New Mexico. And she said, I'll never get justice for my people in this legal system. So she decided to tell stories. That's how she's going to get justice. Her mission, as she says, is to continue the Laguna stories in print. Wait, what? You can't do that. that. Those stories are oral. When they go into print, they lose their life. Don't they? Not when she writes. <laughs> Not when she. They lose their, li their life that's a whole other piece I should have done for you is the nature of literacy, which is to freeze stories or make them appear to freeze on the page and become an object because they're an object now. Of course, we could talk about the Bible as the prime example of that. But yeah, she decided, I'm going to get justice for my people by telling stories. Stories and justice. Interesting. So tonight, I want to share with you her story, Yellow One, which appears in her book, Storyteller. I should have brought Storyteller. It's like a scrapbook. Mm -hmm. It's her photographs. It's just gossip she heard. It's short stories, poetry, other things, and including a short story called Yellow One. Here's how it begins. Sorry. Yeah. This is the opening of the story. What whirlwind man told Kochi Ninako, yellow woman, I myself belong to the wind. And so it is, we will travel swiftly, this whole world, with dust and wind storms. And below that is the single line, my thigh clung with his dance. Mm -hmm. We'd go all night on that line, <laughs> right? Uh, so powerful, so erotic, so symbolic. But let's keep going. The unnamed female narrator awakens at dawn. Next, this is where the story begins. Next to a man on a riverbank. She watches the sunrise. She gets up and walks south. Following their footprints from the day before, she comes across their horses. And she looks for, but cannot see her home. 
she looks for that cannot see her pueblo. She crossed the river. Be careful crossing rivers. She comes back to him and says, wake up, I'm leaving. He says, you're coming with me, remember? Where? To my place. Will I come back? Oh, will you? I don't know, will you? Will it be you when you come back? Yellow, he said. Yellow. Who are you, she says. Last night you guessed my name. And you knew why I had come. But, but, but I only said that you were him and, and that I was Yellow Woman. I'm not really her. I have my own name and I come from the Pueblo on the other side of the Mesa. Your name is Silva. And you're a stranger I met by the river yesterday. Okay. I keep saying that. He says, you can take any one of these lines and just run with it for the rest of your life. He says, what, ha what happened yesterday has nothing to do with what you will do today, yellow woman. No doubt. I know, I know, that's what I'm saying. Those old stories about the Katsina spirit and yellow woman, that can't mean us. Come here, he said gently. Notice how he just ignores her complaints, her questions, because they come from across the river. They have nothing to do with what's happening now. And she says, narrator. I love this, because this is why I titled this a living myth, because this woman is experiencing a myth, a living myth, and the result is a loss of identity. I was wondering if Yellow Woman had known who she was. If she knew that she would become part of the stories, maybe she had another name that her husband's relatives called her, so that only the Katsina from the North and the storytellers would know her as Yellow Woman. Do you know the story, she said. What story? He smiled and pulled me close to him as he said. I don't have to go, she says. What they tell in the stories was real only back then, back in time and memorialist, that, like they say. He's not going to get into an argument about the value of myth. Let's go, he said. This is complete. All these complaints, they have no place here in this world. She says, I walked beside him, breathing hard while he walked fast, his hand around my wrist. I had stopped trying to pull away from him because his hand felt cool and the sun was high, drying the riverbed into alkali. I will, I will see someone. Eventually I will see someone and then I will be certain that he's only a man. Some man from nearby. And I will be sure that I am not Yellow Woman because she's from the past and I live now. And I've been to school, and there are highways and pickup trucks, right, that Yellow Woman never saw. I'm not Yellow Woman, said everyone who was living a myth. I'm not living this myth. They head into the north now. They've been at the river. They head into the north to Mount Taylor or, or uh, Mount... Uh, uh, Say, well, what's the name of it? I can't remember the Laguna name, sorry. They head north into the mountains. The narrator says, I felt hungry and wondered what they were doing at home now. My mother, my grandmother, my husband, and the baby cooking breakfast, probably. Saying, where did she go? Maybe she was kidnapped. And Al, I love that her husband's name is Al. <laughs> right? It should be Al. And Al going to the tribal police with the details well, she went walking along the river. Exactly. She went walking along the river. The narrator says, have you brought women here before? He smiled and kept chewing his food. So I said, do you always use the same tricks? What tricks? 
The story about being a Katsina from the mountains. The story about Yellow Woman. He was silent. His face remained calm. I don't believe it, she said. These stories couldn't happen now, I said. He shook his head and said softly, but someday they will talk about us and they will say, those two lived long ago when things like that happened. Except they're happening now in the story world. Can you see the Pueblo? Silva was standing behind me. We're too far away. Can you see your home? No, you're too far away. Of course. But he says, from here, I can see the world. And he stepped out on the edge. He points out the Texans with their ranches, the Mexicans. Do you ever work for them? No, I steal from them. I started wondering about this man who could speak the Pueblo language so well, but who lived on a mountain and rustled cattle. I decided that this man, Silva, must be a Navajo. <laughs> <laughs> Because Pueblo men didn't do things like that. You must be a Navajo, she says. Silva shook his head gently. Little yellow woman. You never give up, do you? I've told you who I am. The Navajo people know me too. They arrive at Silva's house and the narrator asks Silva if, um, oh, right, I'm repeating that. Um, let's go to the next one. The next morning, so she's now at Silva's house. They've had dinner. She awakens the next morning and she thinks of her family, whom she imagines will report her missing. From the text, if her old grandpa were alive, he would tell them that she'd been stolen by a mountain spirit and would eventually come home. They always do. And this is her thinking. There are enough of them at home to handle things. My mother and grandmother will raise the baby like they raised me. Al will find someone else. And they will go on like before, except now there will be a story about the day I disappeared while I was walking along the river. She decides to return home and walks off, but ends up back at Silva's house, right? because it's not time. When she sees the house, she remembered she intended to go home. But that didn't seem important anymore. They were riding toward Marquez to sell some meat that Silva has butchered, stolen cattle from Colt, stolen cattle. As they're going down the twelve trail, a fat white rancher came up the trail and accused Silva of stealing the cattle. He did. Silva tells the narrator, yellow woman, to ride back up the mountain. She urges her horse to run up the difficult mountain trail. She hears four shots and concludes that Silva has shot the rancher. Instead of continuing up towards Silva's, Silva's house now, she dismounts and starts the horse off alone on the trail she's just traveled. She continues on foot in the opposite direction, sitting for a while by the river and thinking about Silva before walking the rest of the way to her pueblo. Now she can go home. The narrator says, I came back to the place on the riverbank where he had been sitting the first time I saw him. Because you always come back there. The green willow trees that he had trimmed from the branch were still lying there, wilted in the sand. I saw the leaves and I wanted to go back to him to kiss him and to touch him. But the mountains were too far away now. And I told myself, because I believe it, now she will. I told myself, because I believe it, he will come back sometime mm -hmm. and be waiting by the river. Silco, by the way, in interviews says she did this as a teenager all the time. Mm -hmm. She would go down to the river waiting for the casino spirit, who is called Whirlwind Man or Buffalo Man. I followed the path up from the river into the village. The sun was getting low and I could smell supper cooking when I got to the screen door of my house. And I could hear their voices inside. My mother was telling my grandmother how to fix the jello because the mundane keeps being mundane. And my husband Al was playing with the baby. Way to go, Al. 
I decided to tell him that some Navajo had kidnapped me, but I was really sorry that Grandpa wasn't alive to hear my story, because it was the yellow woman's story. short story. Mm. Except it isn't. <laughs> because um, this is a scrap Storyteller is a scrapbook and, and she keeps replaying these yellow woman scenes. Uh, just these tableau. And, and you'll see it here in this poem called Storytelling. Just these flashes of yellow woman scenes. Listen to this poem. Storytelling. You should understand You should understand the way it was back then because it's the same even now. Long ago it happened that her husband left to hunt deer before dawn and that she got up to get water. By the way, this is a motif in the Elmer story. She always is going to get water. She always has a water jar and she always asks the casino spirit, what do I do with my water jar? We can come back to that. Early in the morning she walked to the river when the sun came over the long red mesa. He was waiting for her that morning in the tamarack and the willow beside the river. Buffalo man in buffalo leggings. Are you here already? Yes, he said. He was smiling. Because I came for you. She looked into the shallow, clear water. But where shall I put my water jar? Upside down, right here, he told her on the riverbank. Next scene. You better have a damn good story, her husband said, about where you've been for the past 10 months and these twin baby boys. <laughs> Another scene. No, that gossip isn't true. She didn't elope. She was kidnapped by that Mexican at Siama Feast. You know my daughter isn't that kind of girl. Notice how the othering is happening here. Navajo, Mexican, it's, it's somebody else. This is my favorite scene. It was the summer of 1967. TV news reported a kidnapping. Four Laguna women and three Navajo men headed north along, along the Rio Cuerco River in a red 56 Ford. And the FBI and the state police were hot on their trail of wine bottles and size 42 panties hanging in the bushes and trees <laughs> along the road. We couldn't escape them, he told people later. We tried, but there were four of them and only three of us men. <laughs> Another scene. Seems like it's always happening to me. Outside the dance hall door late Friday night, in the summertime, and those brown-eyed men from Cubero, smiling, they usually ask me, have you seen the way the stars shine up there in the sand hills? And I usually say, no, will you show me? It was that Navajo from Alamo, you know, the tall, good-looking one. <laughs> he told me he'd kill me if I didn't go with him. And then it rained so much, you see, and the roads got muddy, and that's why it took me so long to get back home. <laughs> My husband left after he heard the story. <laughs> Wait. And moved back in with his mother. <laughs> there was so much happening here. It was my fault, and I don't blame him. I could have told the story better than I did. <laughs> Isn't that great? Let me tell you another. Here's another piece from storytelling. It's called Skeleton Fixer. What happened here? She asked, some, kinds of, some kind of accident? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Some kind of accident? Words like bones scattered all over that place? Old man Badger traveled from place to place searching for skeleton bones. There was something only he could do with. On the smooth sand, Old Man Badger started laying out the bones. It was a great puzzle for him. He started with the toes. He loved their curve like a new moon, 
like a white whisker hair. Without thinking, he knew their direction, laying each tailbone to walk east. I know it must have been this way. Yes, he talked to himself as he worked. He strung the spine bones as beautiful as any shell necklace. The leg bones were running so fast, dust from the ankle joints surrounded the wind. Oh, poor dear one who left your bones here, I wonder who you are. You know who he is, right? You know who they are. Old skeleton fixers spoke to the bones, because things don't die. They fall to pieces, maybe. Get scattered or separate, but old man Badger can tell how they once fit together. Though he didn't recognize the bones, he could not stop. <coughs> he loved them anyway. He took great, great care with the ribs, marveling at the structure which had contained the lungs and the heart. Skeleton Fixer had never heard of such things as souls. He was certain only of bones. But where a heart once beat, there was only sand. Oh, I will find you one somewhere around here, Badger said. And a yellow butterfly flew up from the grass at his feet. Ah, I know how your breath left you. Like butterflies over an edge, not falling but fluttering, their wings, rainbow colors. Wherever they are, your heart will be. He worked all day. He was so careful with this one. It felt like the most special of all. Old Man Badger didn't stop until the last spine bone was arranged at the base of the tail. Ahu, my dear one, these words are bones. He repeated this four times. Pa, 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 pa. Pa, 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 pa. Pa, 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 pa. Pa, pa, pa. Pop. Old coyote woman jumped up and took off running. She never even said thanks. <laughs> Skeleton fixer shook his head slowly. It is surprising sometimes, he said, how these things turn out. But he has never stopped fixing the spore, the poor scattered bones that he finds. Silco signs this as a bigger piece, a piece of a bigger story they tell around Laguna and Acoma, too, from a version <coughs> told by Simon Ortiz, who's another Pueblo poet. You see, this is a, one of those oral stories. What's happening here? Skeleton fixers putting Coyote back together much, much later. Coyote doesn't even care. She jumps up and doesn't even say thanks. But, you know, that's Coyote. And that's also Badger. Words like bones. Right? Words like bones. You arrange the words into life. In the 19, early 20th century, Franz Boas was uh, a well-known and well-intentioned anthropologist who wanted to trying to think of the right word. He wanted to collect, archive Native American stories before they were gone. And so he, and when he could not go, he sent his student, Elsie Clues Parsons, to go to Laguna, or Zia, or Zuni, or these Pueblos. And this was amazing work. Uh, they had to learn the languages. And Carizan is not an easy language to learn. Uh, they had to understand the culture. They had to document everything. And these stories are documented in the Bureau of Anthropology journals from 1920, whatever. But they were dead. They were in libraries, on shelves, and nobody pulled them off. But they were once alive. And so what Leslie Marmon Silco does is become skeleton fixer. And she writes a novel called Sarah. 
where a man who's sick, he's so sick, his name is Kale, and he's been to war, but before he went to World War II, he, he was frustrated, and he cursed the rain. Cursed the rain. And so that, that created a drought in Laguna, and he was in the Philippines during World War II, and he ended up on the Bataan Death March. And his cousin Rocky, which was his, who was his hero and was the only reason he joined the army, was killed by the Japanese on the Bataan Death March. And there was just so much rain. It was just rain all the time. So when he comes back to Laguna after all this, he's purging himself. He's throwing up. He's urinating. He's got problems. His body's trying to rid itself of some poison. And they take him to the army psychiatrist he says that he's the psychiatrist asks him asks Teo how he feels and he says I feel like white smoke and so they take him to a traditional Laguna Gila Kush and Kush helps a little bit but this is a disease that Kush has never seen before and so they finally take him to Bethany an old Navajo medicine man who uses the new tools like calendars and clocks. And Bethany creates a sand painting ritual for him. A Navajo ritual, not a Pueblo ritual, a Navajo ritual. It doesn't matter, right? Because the Navajo and Pueblo are so close. To, and it just doesn't matter because he's sick. And as you may know, in a sand painting ritual, you put yourself at the center of the world and you recreate the, the, the uh, medicine man recreates the world around you. And so he does what he can for Tao and he says, but you need a good ceremony. And he does. And the rest of the novel is about two thirds of the novel is about him performing the ceremony. And interlaced throughout the novel are the stories that Elsie Clues Parsons had recorded. Wow. And so, this novel, which was published in 1978 and for a long time, was the most assigned novel on college campuses. Those stories are now out there in the world. Through print. Because it's not just about putting them in print. You've got to do the, the skeleton fixer ceremony. Words like bones. Right? And we know this. When we read a myth on a page, it's a lot like reading a skeleton. It's been stripped from its culture. It's been stripped from its ritual context. We're reading it here uh, in California when it may have originated in Iceland. It's a museum. Right? Unless you're in Iceland, because they still believe that stuff. Have you ever been there? They're amazing. This is not a... a dichotomy for them. Anyway, let's not get talking about ice. But uh, <laughs> what we can do is what Silco has done for us, is to create, is to participate in an imaginative orality, where we understand the culture from which the story arises. If you do that, and Silco does it for us all the time, and other Native writers do it for us, they provide the context then it's not no longer a zombie myth. It's a living myth. Frankly, Gerald Visner here recognizes his, he's a Anishinaabe, but he recognizes this kind of storytelling in postmodernism. So I thank you. I thought you'd tell me to wrap it up. <laughs> hey, I'm hurrying. <laughs> thank you. Here's what he says, and I'll close with this. Uh, Gerald Visner's wonderfully weird, wild, and possibly insane, but uh, he's also brilliant. Listen to this. And then you can see the title of the book. He's just messy. He's the trickster, right? He's a contemporary Native American trickster. Manifest manners, post Indian warriors of surviving, really. <laughs> and, and you should, you'll hear. This is how it is. Right? 
Manifest destiny would cause the death of millions of tribal people from massacres, disease, and the loneliness of reservations. Entire cultures have been terminated in the course of nationalism. These histories are now the simulations of dominance and the causes of the conditions that have become manifest manners in literature. The post-Indian simulations are the core of survivance. He's deliberately not saying survival because that is embedded in the old colonial discourse. Post-Indian simulations, art, literature, are the new stories of tribal courage. The simulations of manifest manners are the continuance of the surveillance and domination of tribes and literature. Simulations are the absence of the tribal real. The post-Indian conversions are in the new stories of survivance over dominance, the natural reason of the tribes anteceded by thousands of generations, the invention of the Indian. The post-Indian outs the inventions with what? Humor, new stories, and simulations of survivance. Right? Um, there's another Native American writer, Sherman Alexi, who in his work at sometimes writes, um, he, has, he said it two different ways. But it, well, I'm just going to tell you the one way. Literature equals angry uh, equals anger times the imagination for Native mm -hmm. people. Literature mm -hmm. equals anger times the imagination. Okay. Oh, and the other piece, the other formula is survival equals anger times the imagination. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you didn't understand what I just read from Bismarck, but maybe you got the sense of here's his best line, and okay. I'll close with this. And I think it applies tonight with Yellow and what Silco has done with that story and for us. Listen, Native American Indian stories are told and heard in motion, imagined and read over and over on a landscape that is never seen at once. Words are heard in winter rivers. Crows are written on the poplars. Last words are never the end. Thank you for your attention. by ritual or any belief. It's just a zombie. Just but it's a still story. There. story. Yeah. That's what mm -hmm. used to happen in the... Yes, it, well, that's what happens to myths. That's right. what happens in oral cultures. They yeah. change, they slough off. You know, they're not applicable anymore, but we don't get that in literary culture because we keep them. Right. Yeah, and sometimes we keep them when they're dead and we keep, well, they keep coming at us maybe like zombies. And so what year, years was this myth written? Because we were talking about the politics of yeah. like the women's movement in the 70s and she, the way she talked about men and the story. And, so problem. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the backlash against the, a lot of the movements in the 80s. Like this, how long, what was the time span of this scrapbook that you talked about? Oh. <coughs> Published in 81, um, it was after ceremony. Um, what, there was no real backlash. She's a Native American writer, so nobody's listening. Do myths get updated, though? Absolutely. Okay. They have to or they'll die. Right. Right? This was never a problem for an oral culture, for a myth to go. Mm -hmm. You know? It's only a literate culture that tries to hang on to it. Um, so yeah. But it's, this isn't an oral. Right. Yet this is a written myth. I mean, it's a Yeah, book. but I just told it to you. Oh, oh I see. Yeah, it's both, okay. right? And that's her genius. Um, can I tell you a great story, another story? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we love stories. So I, I, was, I did a summer uh, seminar at Yale. I was writing a book on Silco, and so I'm, I'm dealing with all this, right? And what we didn't talk about too much was print. We talked about writing, but then print. So there's, there's Marshall McLuhan, medium is the message you may have heard of. He was in Annie Hall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you know, right? Um, and there's a, a woman named Elizabeth Eisenstein. And they see something differently ha uh, happening with print, because writing is one thing, because it's a little more uh, fluid, it's paper, it's, it's not stable, it's not bound, mm -hmm. but 
print, especially for McLuhan, says we're hypnotized by print. So I was at Yale study and I was doing all this stuff and I went to the Beinecke Rare Book Library. And I'm like, yeah, because it's Yale and how often am I going to be there? And it was awesome. And Yale, that library is known for a number of things. One of them is a Gutenberg Bible. Like a Gutenberg Bible. Wow. Okay. And so I'm going there to see the Gutenberg Bible and it's this magnificent, they have like this translucent marble for the, it was amazing. And so I'm, I'm in a kind of mood, right? I'm in a very somber, like the veil between the sacred and the profane is very thin that day. <laughs> The Gutenberg Bible's on an end, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, well, you know, that's what screwed us, screwed us all up, is this printed Bible of all things, you know. I walk around like this, and here's the manuscript of ceremony. Oh, wow. And I'm like, wow. wait, what? This is a book that was supposed to end storytelling. This is a story in a book that, this, that celebrates the story never. And it was her draft, so she changed stuff. It was marked up, right? It was fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful moment, right? Anything else? Any, or did I answer your question? Yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of what I lived in New Mexico for almost 40 years, and I'm thinking about like what's happening now. Are there some new stories? To, because there's so much pollution on the Rio Grande and the radiation from Los Alamos. Yeah. And yeah. Just when you talked about anger and imagination, yeah. like right. what's going on now to help the Native Americans and the mm -hmm. Pueblos? Well, it's the same old, same old. And everything's new all at the same time. And so I now follow, since Standing Rock, I've started following people, Native people on Twitter. And they're doing that. There's a great Twitter handle called Not Your Mascot, for example. And they're doing this. They're in the political dialogue. Their bodies are in the political dialogue. And they're telling stories and playing music. Joy Harjo is a Muscogee Creek poet who has a band where she plays her poetry. It's called Poetic Justice. <laughs> so it's all happening. It doesn't get into you know, the main stream Media. Yeah, I almost hate to say that because it's not even media, social media. It doesn't get into the mainstream social media. Yeah. But if you look, if you look for it, it's there. This is what I want to tell the world. If you look for it, it's still there. But if you're not already a leftist, yeah, it's, people aren't going to know about this stuff. I, I don't think anybody, even leftists, don't know about no, this. No, they don't. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Are but you talking you, about the mythology? Or, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's the whole reason. I'm talking about the politics and the oppression, and which has to be in the mythology. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. And I think that's part of the frustration of the left and, frankly, the right, is that you're trying to spin this story, and that story is gone. Mm -hmm. And, frankly, for the, if there are any leftists in the audience, what we used to do is gone, mm -hmm. because this is the nature of myth. The myth has changed right. for us, for America. Right. And we're struggling to find a new We are. Yeah. And um, this is not a bad thing. This is Shiva. You know, yeah. this is creation uh, and well, destruction. Kali Yuga, right? And yeah, Kali Yuga. We're, we're right up to date. <laughs> yeah, you can see Kali everywhere. But this was Shiva would lie down in front of her and stop her. <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is a great point. It's hard to watch. Um, we are, our myths are changing right now. And I hear people on the left, and frankly people on the right, saying we've got to go back to X, or Y, or Z. That's gone. We need a new myth. And frankly, um, if I may be so bold, I think Will, this what Will's doing, what Devin's doing, what UPR is doing. You know, it's self-serving to think that, but I really think, I get 50 people on a Tuesday night in L.A. who come out to hear about ISIS. And I ask them sometimes, what are you doing here? <laughs> and they're like, we need something. I'm like, all right, let's find out what you need and get it. Because it's all right here. Never left. Good stuff. Yes? I've been uh, turning over this thought in my mind today at the conference, and it wasn't the place to bring it out. And so it's an unfound kind of thought. It's amusing. 
Um, I, I'm just wondering if the, maybe this is not even, maybe I'm off topic. So That's all right. That, um, the ghost dancing yeah. that began. Yeah. And it came through somebody getting a download and then saying, hey, this is what we need to do. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. A Paiute. Yeah. And, and people going around saying, this is what we need to do. And my, um, I'm, uh, I've got a Master's in Divinity, so I, I think about these things. And um, so in terms of uh, one God versus many gods versus holistic, you know, all of this. So I, there was something about the ghost dancing myth or that story that yeah. seemed to sort of conge congeal everyone into to one kind of spirit. And it was frightening, and, and some more slaughtered. It's my understanding that um, Sand, Creek, the Sand Creek Massacre was connected to that. Mm -hmm. um, well, Wounded Knee. Right, or Wounded Knee. Yeah. Sand Creek was not connected to that. Well, it's all ultimately connected, but not, yeah. not directly not to, to the ghost dance. Okay. So there were no ghost dancing in Sand Creek. There was ghost dancing everywhere. But not in Sand Creek. Okay. So yeah. So I guess I'm I'm just thinking about the shift that came and the way that um, different nations sort of were congealed yeah. to try to survive with yeah. this new myth. Right. Right. That's a result of well, that goes back to contact, European contact, where. Speaking of things people don't know, the continent before Spain and, and Europe um, was the most diverse the continent's ever been. Thousands of tribes, tens of thousands of languages, just in California. Um, so just incredible diversity that you encounter when you cross the mountain, across the river. Um, it was, it was just incredibly diverse, more than we can even imagine. Uh, Europeans arrive and say, oh, you Indians. And they're like, who? He's, he's Apache, I'm Navajo. We, are, we hate each other. Why are you putting us together? In fact, don't let me go too long, too long on this, so I'll never stop. One of the genius elements of ceremony is this very thing that you're talking about. Teo is a Laguna Pueblo, mixed breed, whatever, but he goes, and so he experiences racism and bigotry. He goes, he joins the army, and he is now in. He is one of them. Why? Because they have a common enemy. The Japs, right? The Japs. And so if we can scapegoat someone, right. if we both can scapegoat someone, hey, you're my friend, until the scapegoat's gone. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the real struggle of Teo and ceremony is when he comes back. He had been part of the dominant culture by virtue of another enemy and other enemy. He comes back, and now he's back in that original position mm -hmm. where he is the other. Sorry, I don't know if I answered your question, but you no, got me started. I, I, I'm just, I, it's been bubbling today, yeah. and I've been trying to kind of just bring it out. Yeah, out of well, more. what really struck me about your comment was this kind of unity. Yeah. Right. It was kind of like a, a story that came uh, from another realm. Right. That was sort of like this mission of like, we, you know, we need to like, we do this ghost dance, but then again, right. Us. And, and such unity and such new myths, I would argue, um, well, it's not me. Like everything else I'm saying, I stole this. Uh, there's a literary critic at Yale named Jay, Jay Hillis Miller who says that all storytelling is constructed over loss. I think it's response to suffering. The stories that create unity, that create healing. Yeah, that's Teo and Sarah. So, yes. So, so a couple of things. Um, one, somebody was asking about um, that time when Silka was writing mm -hmm. um, Storyteller, 
Um, but I think it's interest to, interesting to note that um, ceremony came out in the late 70s and it was about yeah. World War II. That's right. But it was, in many ways, you could see it's about Vietnam War sure. and about the veterans and, and yeah. the situation there. But, you know, very difficult for her to write about that. A lot easier to place it in World War II exactly. to make it the, the Jacks as the enemy. Exactly. Um, and then the, the other piece, though, is, is kind of fresh, and so bear with me as I'm kind of thinking loud, but, um, so, so you brought this, I'm very familiar with the novel, and so, but, but for other people, you, you mentioned about how, you know, he sees himself as this gray smoke, that yeah. he's, he's, he's not material. Exactly. He's immaterial. Exactly. And, and maybe you, you hinted at this, and you said it, and I didn't quite catch it, but now I am, um, the way that the myths were oral. They were in the air. They were in material. And she brought them, and he's mixed. You know, he's this new kind of person. And she brought that onto the page. She took something that was in the mist Mm -hmm. and brought it and turned it into the black and white onto the page into something that was material. Yes, which Um, is exactly what a ceremony yeah, and, and so that's the third piece. It's a ceremony of print. Yes, is that um, when I when I teach the novel, and I haven't done this for a long taught it for quite a while, but um, what is the ceremonies that we need today? Yeah. You know, what are the ceremonies that we can create that Betsy yes. comes up with these new ceremonies for exactly. that time? But in you know amongst us, as we're looking at the ecological crisis, and, and we're looking at the Trump crisis and everything else, you know, what are the ceremonies and the rituals that we're creating with our marches and our protests and our writing and our, the things that we are doing. And these discussions we're having right now. Right. Yes. right. yes. The, new, the new myths, but also yeah. the, new, the new ceremony. Yeah. I, wow, good stuff. Do you, anybody else read ceremony? A few people? Do you remember Teo's mother? Yellow. Failure to negotiate. Failure to negotiate. Uh, you're talking about contemporary culture? Yeah. Yeah. I think it go, for me, it goes to intention. I don't think there's any intention to negotiate. I don't see it in the culture. I see fear and closing in to protect the identities we have, even at the point of a gun. Whereas every myth tells you you've got to let that shit go, including your identity. If you don't, you're dying. That's the hero's journey. You have to die. So, yeah. I I understand if you're afraid, and you have many reasons to be afraid, but if you try to hold on to something that you think you are, you're in deep trouble. And the culture's in deep trouble when that gets weaponized or even leveraged. The culture's in deep. Because it means what print means. You stop and you die, in my opinion. Yes, sir? I wanted to ask a little bit more about um, new myth. Yeah. Yeah, We need a myth, as you say. There's new myths um, coming up. What, uh, What would you say that new myths are not going to be? as opposed to what wow. they are going to be? Fantastic question. I've never had that question. First of all, they're not going to be the old myths. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and I know that sounds coy, but I, I think we reach back and yeah. think they're still available. They're not. What are the new myths going to be? I don't know. What do you all think? I'm not sure I know. Yeah. Well, I keep thinking of the movie Avatar. Yeah. Because it really is about ecology and destruction of nature but I don't think that's new I think I think everything's recycled you know the stories that we tell and the history enough. our history look at it just repeats and repeats especially the worst parts I get uh, thank you so I when guess you I say there's, this is new I don't know if it's really new right I should, thank you I should be more precise it's not the myths we just came out of those okay. are too recent those are what broke they broke <laughs> What does Elliot say in the wasteland? 
these fragments I try to shore up against my ruins. The ruins. But yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. They do come around, just not the most immediate ones, in my opinion. Well, and also some of the n new myths that I'd like to see recycled would be like Buddhism and, you know, um, uh, nonviolent communication and, yeah. you know, well, things that are, will really work for the culture well, and community. Me too. To, to give you a, a better answer, it's going to be technological. Uh, I know. But how is that going to Well, it's going to be augmented reality and it's going to be artificial reality. Yeah. I so we'll just be artificial intelligence after we destroy all the human beings on the planet? <laughs> right, like that Star Trek episode. Oh, okay. Um, but we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. This, we're living, and we're really living this movie, but we don't know who's going to live and who's going to die and what's going to happen. And what's real. Mm -hmm. Right. Because uh, my wife was trying to get a package delivered yesterday, and she was arguing on the phone, and I said, you know you're talking to a bot. <laughs> 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 you're getting really upset at this bot. But, you know, I've done the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, right. And, and I'll tell you what, you've talked to a bot too, and you don't know it. I guarantee you. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've screamed. I'm on hold with you. You are? Yeah. And I scream. I mean, I've screamed in the series, you know, so we know that she screamed. There are universities out there who are creating algorithms to right. teach. And if we don't yeah. become better teachers, they're, it's going to work. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, come back. Yeah. yeah the, the other thing you said was that um, we're hypnotized by the printed word, that was but cool. less so by the written word. And I was imagining that whatever the new myth is, it can't be fixed like the printed word is a fixed yeah. Unchanging exactly. kind of exactly. thing. Exactly, it's got to be done. Yeah. But there's something fluid about the written word. That's right. Do you think that the technological stuff can acquire fluidity in I some way? I think it already has. I, yeah. think it, okay. I think that's its virtue, or at least, I shouldn't say virtue, that's yeah. its advantage, is its fluidity, its, fluidity, its adaptability. Right? right? Um, and I know that probably scares us all, and it should. Um, I mean, we're talking about Skynet, basically. Um, what is that? From Terminator. You don't know Terminator? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. You're going to be the first to go. I don't think I ever saw it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man! No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> you better watch Terminator or you're not going to survive the apocalypse. <laughs> okay. I, I think you're right on target. I, that's why I say it's going to be AI. It's going to be digital. And there are people working on this that are really interesting and looking for consciousness in AI. Uh, not just consciousness, but looking for therapeutic value in AI. Such as, you know, one of the most annoying things about data is that it tells you what you don't want to hear. Right? And it's scientific. And, you, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, I, I, um, I exercise this much a week, and, you know, and I'm pretty fit, and then your Apple Watch goes, nope, <laughs> right? Data, big data, and all that comes with it, AI, and what Joan Baudrillard called the simulacrum, there are lessons there, human lessons, I believe. But aren't they interpreted? Of course, that's why they're human. Yeah. When we lose that, we're done. Okay. Yes. I believe, sir, you had your hand up, didn't you? Uh, and then we'll come over here. Yes. Uh, just maybe very too simplistic, but I, I remember being in Africa and then in the small tribe, and every night, literally, the fires were lit and the drums were played, and the story of the village was told. Nice. You know, and it was, it just went on. Yeah. And on. And it grew as the village yes, was. exactly. And my question sort of was, and I don't know, it's just a thought, that where is the, you know, the new village, and the, the technological village, right. and the village that actually, that I think, I think that's where the new myth comes, is back to the village and the storytelling. 
Now, which movies do certainly, but I think that it's, it's maybe smaller than that and simpler than that in my head at least. Let me run with it a little bit. Um, we need a sacred space because that's where the story is. So we need, we're talking about ritual. Absolutely. Now, how do we have that? Did we ever have it as a nation? Well, hmm. back then. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a nation. The many nations. Many nations. Yeah, exactly. Right. Very interesting. interesting. And lots of ritual. And I think we came over with ritual from uh, Europe had rituals. Yeah. I don't think that, it's just that we've lost the ideas, maybe, and the ideals of ritual. I agree. I agree. I think that's a missing piece for us. Um, yeah. I, I remember 9-11 and thinking, this is it. I mean, this is horrible, this is tragic, but this is the moment. The old myths are gone, they're broken, let's build something new. This is the time. And the president said, go shop. Right. Well, oh. right. And go to war. Sure. And, and go to war. Another. To the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we don't have to get it. But those are our operating myths. Well, yes. Yeah. yeah. We yes. reinstated. Right. Yeah. Right. What was comfortable and familiar. Yeah. The mall is a sacred place. Yeah. Ever read Don DeLillo's White Women? It's the grocery store. Secret store. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I think that there is an awakening happening, and um, we're talking about, we're using the word myth, but one word that hasn't been brought up is, is archetype. And I think one of what we're playing with is this idea of unity versus multiplicity. And I'm wondering if it's instead of speaking to a new myth, that we're speaking to this kind of simultaneity of multiple interpermeating things. Uh -huh. And I think when we bring up the idea of an archetype, I think what has been happening is this over-identification, which of course we know that when that happens, a compensation happens. Over-identification. Over-identification to answer and respond to. Yeah. So when you brought up AI, I mean, one, we know technology has always been here, you know, in different, sure. in different images. But the thing that's speaking to AI, I think, is is gender identification, this emergence of new genders, and of this way of living a multiplicitous view yes. of identity. Yes. And when we're talking about um, you know, over-identification, particularly with an archetype, it does, it dismantles the identity. Yes. So something must come up. I mean, right now, yes, it's, it's, it's this kind of fluid between male and female. Um, but I happen to be doing some work on, on uh, what's being called other kin, odd kin, where all of these other images are rising with people identifying with more than just this duality of male yes. or female. Yes. Bringing in the natural world, the aeromorphic, the you know, animal world, all of that. Yes. Um, so I think if we start thinking, you know, in multiplicitous ways, that's a way to pull all of this. Yeah, yeah is this a part of transhumanism or posthumanism, or is it a, a little bit. Yeah, yes. yeah, right. But right. a great deal, a lot of it is coming out of um, film. And Tolkien. Yeah. Tolkien is a huge generation sure. of this, so. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, my favorite line in Lord of the Rings, by the way, just for free, no charge mm -hmm. for this, is I always forget where they're lost, but they've just lost Gandalf mm -hmm. in those caves. Of something with an M, Mordor. 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 That's where the people are. Yeah. It's, it's the yes, Minas Tirith. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Gandalf <laughs> disappears. He drops off into this chasm or something. And I'm like, well, what are we going to do? And I think it's Frodo who says, then we go on without hope. Mm -hmm. no. Say it again. We go on without hope. Because they say he was our hope and he's gone. Oh, I see. And they say we must go on without hope. It's, it's just keep breathing.